Good evening, everyone, for our third night of God Answers Our Questions. We remember what is truth, and then last night, the pandemic. You know, wasn't that awesome? Do you remember watching it? Matthew 24, and how he brought up the prophecies, the time we're living in, what is truth, and how Jesus said this would happen. And the truth is, he said he would return. And within that series, the pastor brought up last night, we know without a doubt, truth is, Jesus will return. And tonight is, what Je was Jesus who he said he was? Was Jesus who he said he was? All right, uh, let's have prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the privilege of coming into your house and into your everybody's home online all those that are watching, Father, may your Holy Spirit reach down and touch each and every one of us uh, that we uh, partake of what the word is being shared tonight, that we can see who Jesus really was, is, and always will be. We thank you, Father, for the pastor as he presents this message. And we know without a doubt, Father, you're going to reach down from heaven and touch his lips uh, and anoint him. And Father, I just want to take a moment and shoot a prayer up. Nancy and several others have lost people here recently again to COVID. Uh, I ask you to be with them and their families in a very special way. We thank you, Father, that we can always come to you. Now we ask you to anoint our brother as he breaks bread with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank you, John, for the introduction. And for the prayer, it's, uh, COVID is a tough one. Like I said, it, it seems to be a gamble. You don't know what you're going to get. You can get deathly ill and die. Uh, you can have very minor symptoms. And I encourage you guys to uh, just, if, 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 if nothing else, take common sense measures. Get new, good nutrition at this time and uh, wash hands a lot. Uh, but anyways, uh, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to continue on in God's word and let God answer our questions. And again, I want to thank you for our introduction, but tonight's title is not, um, is, was Jesus who he said he was, but tonight's title is, Is It All God's Fault? Is it all God's fault? Tomorrow night, I'm sorry, not tomorrow night because we're taking a break tomorrow. We're not going to be here tomorrow, so don't live stream, don't join us um, on YouTube or Facebook, and certainly don't come here in person because we're taking a break on Monday, but we're coming back Tuesday at 7. So Tuesday at 7, we'll be back, uh, and so you'll want to join us at 7 o'clock Tuesday on YouTube or on Facebook, but we'll come back for, was Jesus who he said he was? And I'm going to show you this through, believe it or not, there is a prophecy in the Bible that is forbidden to read. There is a prophecy in the Bible that a group of people have forbidden anybody to read, and I'm going to show you that on Tuesday night. It's at 7 p.m., but that is Tuesday. Tonight, we want to talk about, is it all God's fault? Is it all God's fault? Now, this is a topic that really gets me excited. This is a topic that I really appreciate and truly appreciate talking about because many people blame God for different tragedies that happen in their lives. Is it God's fault my mom got into a car accident? Is it God's fault I got a divorce because my spouse cheated on me? Is it God's fault I lost my job? I never did anything wrong. Why me? Is it God's fault my friend loved one got COVID and died? Is it God's fault my house burned down? Is it God's fault there are millions of starving children around the world right now? You fill in the blank. Is it God's fault blank because this happened to me or this happened to somebody I love or this? You fill in the blank. The question tonight is, is it God's fault that these terrible things happen around us all the time? 
I want to pause before I get into this and just say another quick prayer because it would be very arrogant of me and pompous to think that I could adequately answer the questions and, 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 and fulfill the desires you have for answers if you went through a tragedy recently. But I just want to pray that our hearts will be open to hearing God's word and to getting a little bit of a reasonable um, understanding of what's at play to help um, satisfy um, your, your questions that you have. So let's pray. Father, I just ask that you'll send the Holy Spirit to lead us through your word. I pray that those who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are feeling the sting of sin in their lives today and right now, Father, that you will give them a peace that only you can give, that you will give them a comfort born from heaven, Father, that warms their hearts, Lord, and lets them know that there is something better and that there is an end. Lord, they say that time heals all wounds, but that is simply not true. You heal all wounds. It just takes time. And I pray that tonight and these answers we get in the Bible will help help lead towards healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many years ago when I was working, I used to live out in Oregon. I was working out in Oregon and I heard this story on the radio. I was actually driving home from work listening to the radio and the, the story came on, this man was a volunteer firefighter, and he got this call that there had been an accident. A car got stuck on the railroad tracks, and a train smashed into the car. So immediately, being a good volunteer fireman, he turned on the light on his car, and he headed straight to the scene of the accident to administer some kind of help. He was a first responder. And not only was he a first responder, but in this case, he was the the very first person on the scene. And as he turned a corner and got within eyesight of the train tracks, he noticed something very familiar. And his heart sank within his chest, and he thought to himself, oh, no. As he got a little bit closer, his deepest fears were confirmed. As he approached the tracks... Being the first one to the accident, he could see his wife and his three kids all dead inside the car that got smashed by the train. I can only imagine what that man was going through. I can only imagine how his heart nearly stopped as he took in the scene of losing his family and the great tragedy that just struck his life. How did the world we live in get to a place where unimaginable things like this happen all too often, far too happen? How did we get to this place? In the beginning, God created everything perfect and beautiful. The climate was fair. The animals lived in harmony. God speaks of creation in this way. Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. When God created the world, it wasn't just all right, okay, it was very good, it was perfect. But as we look around, all is not good, all is not okay today. We live with suffering, pain, sorrow, grief, sickness, death. No, no as, as we look around, everything is certainly not perfect so tonight, we will try to understand just what happened. Tonight, we will try to answer that question we have all asked, and maybe still do from time to time, how could a loving God create this? But before we answer that question, first, we need to get a description of who God is. So let's get a description of who God is. The Bible, and remember, we learned on night number one that we can trust the Bible as a reliable source of truth. We can trust the Bible to tell us the truth. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. We have seen so far that God wants to have a relationship with us. We have seen so far that God wants to tell us what is about to take place. We have seen so far that God will reveal secrets to his people in the last couple nights we've been meeting. Like a good father, God was there for Daniel, and like a good father, God wants to be there for you as well. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. But if God is so loving, the question is, why is there so much pain? 1 John 1, 5 gives us a little more insight. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
if God is love and if God is light, then again I ask the question, why is there so much damage taking place in this world? Why do tragedies strike all the time? We just heard tonight before we came up to do this presentation that somebody's close friend died from COVID. A question that people ask is, is it God's fault? Is he getting us back for what we've done? Or perhaps a more personalized version of that same question, is God getting me back for something that I've done? Many times in life, people think that God sits behind a computer just like this one, waiting for somebody to walk by after they've done something wrong so he can smite them, hit his smite button and just take care of that person. It seems that people blame God, or everything on God. There's that song by Pearl Jam, which is a remake from somebody else. Oh, where, oh, where did my baby go? The Lord took her away from me. That's, of course, the last kiss song. And it was an act of God. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but an act of God is defined by this, by the American Law Society. Act of God, an event that directly and exclusively results from the occurrence of natural causes that could not have been prevented by the exercise of foresight or caution. An inevitable accident. Courts have recognized various events as acts of God. Tornadoes are an act of God. Earthquakes, an act of God. Death, act of God. Extraordinarily high tides, act of God. Violent winds, act of God. And yes, floods are an act of God. Many insurance policies for property damage exclude from their protection damages caused by acts of God. Now, that should come as no surprise to us. I mean, if this was an act of God, you would think that he should be responsible, not the insurance company. But I would suggest to you that insurance companies aren't looking out for their best or, or for your best well-being. They're looking out for their own greed, and they would like to define everything as an act of God because then they would never have to pay out what you pay in. You know, it's interesting too many people have this perception of what an act of God is, and they define it just as this. If something's unexplainable or if something's tragic, it's God's fault. He's just paying us back. He gave me this earthquake to pay me back. He threw this tornado my way to pay me back. These high tides, these violent winds, these floods, that's because I did something wrong and God's paid me back. You know, it's interesting. A couple years ago, my wife had a friend that she knew from high school who died. And this was a very particularly bad way to die. He was in a car accident, and his car rolled over. And as it rolled over, the seatbelt got locked, and he couldn't get out of it. And in the process of all this happening, the gas tank sprung a leak and caught on fire. And this man literally burned to death in his car, waiting to get help. And as the details of the accident came out, my, my wife was talking to her brother, and her brother said, I just wonder what he did that he deserved to die like that. As if anybody deserves to die like that. Many in that situation ask, where was God? How could God do that? How could God allow that? Another question is, who is responsible for these great tragedies that we see around us all the time? Who's responsible for all the pain? Who's responsible for all the human suffering? I want you to open up your Bibles tonight. If you're, if you're at home, you still need to open up your Bible because I didn't put it on the screen. I just put the reference on the screen. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. If you're joining me here, open up your Bible to Matthew 13. And when you get there, say amen. Matthew chapter 13, 24 through 30. Matthew 13, 24 through 30. The Bible says in verse 24 of Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not you sow good seed in your field? From when or from where then do the tares come? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will you then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you root also the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus tells this parable, and maybe like some of you, maybe like some of you at home, the disciples just didn't get it. They heard the parable from Jesus himself, but they didn't understand the parable. The disciples are scratching their heads wondering, what in the world is Jesus talking about this time? And so we see they asked him what it meant. And we're going to skip down to verse 36 because that's where Jesus gives us an explanation of what this parable actually means. In verse 36, we're going to see the disciples ask Jesus a question. He tells them a story about a man planting seed and an enemy planting weed in a field, and the disciples missed it, and Jesus is going to explain it to us. Verse 36, Matthew 13, verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares in the field. Master, we didn't understand what you meant, but that one caught our attention. It seems like there's something special about that parable you said. We just need to know the definition. Could you please explain it to us? And just like we have all of our questions for God, so did the disciples. And from this example, we can see that Jesus is always patient with us when we have questions. God always takes time out of his day to answer our questions, and Jesus is about to answer the questions for the disciples. Now, what did the parable mean? That is the question, and Jesus is going to explain it, starting in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Now, I just want to pause right there really quick and make sure we understand who the Son of Man is. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus, it was a phrase that Jesus used to call himself all the time. Jesus would identify himself as the son of man. And here Jesus is saying, he that sowed the good seed is me. I'm the one in the parable that sowed the good seed. Moving on, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now, do we have to ask who the devil is? No, he's the great adversary. He's the enemy. He is the wicked of the wicked, right? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend them, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I love how Jesus finishes the explanation of this parable. He says, he who has ears, let him hear. Jesus says, listen, I know that bad things happen to you, but you need to know one thing. First of all, I didn't do it. It was our enemy who planted the bad seed. He's responsible for it. Secondly, he says, I'm going to take care of it. I might not take care of it right now, but there's coming a day where I'm sending my angels and they are going to separate the wheat from the tares and destroy all the wickedness and preserve all the righteous. And then he concludes by saying, if you have ears to hear, pay attention to what I'm saying. Gather hope from this. Gather comfort from this. The devil, according to Jesus, is the enemy that brought evil into this world. Now, the Bible reveals Satan is the real cause of problems in this world. While we point the finger and blame on God for just about everything that goes wrong, according to the Bible, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, God still causes the sun to raise on the righteous and on the unrighteous. He causes the rain to come down on the evil, I'm sorry, on the, on the good and the wicked. But the devil would like us to think 
that he is some horn-headed, bat-winged, triangle-tailed, pitchfork-carrying devil. He wants to represent himself like this picture over here and make you think that he's just some ghoul or some spook that you see in somebody's lawn decorated for Halloween. He doesn't want you to believe that he's real because if he doesn't exist, then everything is certainly God's fault. But Jesus is trying to tell us what really took place. The devil is the enemy, and he doesn't look like this picture here. He started out like this picture over here on the left. From the day he was created, he was a beautiful angel, created for the glory of God. He was the highest angel in all of heaven. Lucifer, here, the way he was created, Lucifer lux equals light, and Pharaoh bearer. Lucifer was the highest angel in heaven, and he was designed to be the light bearer. He was designed to bring the truth to other beings in the universe. That's what he was created for. He was created to be next to God. But he became Satan, which means enemy or adversary. The question is, how can a perfect angel that's meant to be right next to God, that is meant to be the highest of all the angels in heaven, who is a light bearer, who is made perfect. How can Lucifer, the light bearer, become Satan, the enemy, or the adversary? What happened? Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9, gives us some insight. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now, everybody loves it when the pastor says, go to Revelation, because it's the last book of the Bible. It's easy to find. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. There are two books in the Bible that are very easy to find. Genesis, which means beginning, the first book of the Bible, and Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. Those are the two easiest books to find, and so everybody loves it when the pastor says, go to Genesis or go to Revelation. Tonight, we want to go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. How did Lucifer, the light bearer, become Satan, the enemy or the adversary? Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, when we think of war, maybe we think of something happening in the Middle East, or maybe we think of something happening in this world, but certainly when we think of heaven, we don't think think about war, do we? Is John the Revelator describing a real war in heaven, or is he describing something else? Is John trying to get a message to us that we need to use a little bit of studying, a little bit of deciphering to get to? We know there is no weapon forged that could ever harm or hurt God. He is omnipotent. That means all-powerful. Not only is he omnipotent, but he's omniscient. That means he knows everything. So even if you were forging a weapon that could possibly hurt him, he would know it, and he would just come and destroy that weapon before you finished making it. So we know that there is no weapon that is ever forged that could hurt him or harm him. Jesus gave his disciples authority to cast out demons, and Paul cast out demons through the name of Jesus in the book of Acts. The Bible tells us in James 2.19 that the devils tremble. The wicked angels and the devil trembles at the very name of God. So what is John trying to tell us here when he says that there was a war in heaven? What message is John trying to get to us? Notice the word that John chose to describe war. You don't see this in the English, but if you had a Greek Bible, you would see it. It's polemos. Polemos, that's the word that, that John used to describe word. What English word do you think we get from polemos? Polemic. We get the English word polemic from the Greek word polemos. Now, what is polemic? Polemic is a noun, a disputant, a controversy, one who writes in support of an opinion or system in opposition to another. 
In other words, let's just think of a political campaign. Now, it hasn't been that long since we had an election, and you guys have seen this many times in your life. A polemic is somebody that campaigns for themselves and tears down somebody else at the same time. Somebody who lifts themselves up while tearing down somebody else at the same time. Do we see that when when political campaigns come out on TV? Do we see somebody saying, look, I'm so great, vote for me, and this guy over here or this woman over here is trash in a bag. Throw them in the dumpster. Do we see that kind of message on TV? John is trying to tell us that Satan did this same thing to God. Satan built up his case to all the angels and any sympathizer who would give him an ear, while at the same time tearing down the character of God. That's the war that John was describing that took place in heaven. Revelation 12.9 tells us that Satan was so successful that he led a third of the angels in rebellion against God. He lied to them about the character of God and deceived the angels. Now the question becomes... Why would Satan do this? What was his purpose? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 12, verse, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 14. Now, Isaiah is in the middle of the Bible, and I know that we're going through a lot of Bible verses tonight. I understand that, and I hope you're still tracking with us at home. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, but I really want God to answer this question for you and not Pastor Jay. There's power in the Word of God. There's no power in anything that I say. The only power I have is if I'm reading what the power here already said. So we need to go to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Why would Satan use polemi, or why would he become a polemic? Why would he war against God? Isaiah chapter 12, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 14, one of these days, I'm going to get that reference right so everybody can get on the same page with me. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, let's read. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I, 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 I. Satan had a what kind of problem? An I problem. I, 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 I. Now, we all have good friends in life, and we've all been around these types of people. Some people we know are so sanguine, and I'm not saying sanguine is a bad thing. Sanguine is a great personality trait. If you're a sanguine at home, praise God, that's a great personality trait. I love sanguine people. I happen to be partly sanguine. But I will say this. We all have some friends that hang out in our circles, and they kind of have this eye problem as well, don't they? They always have to be the center of the conversation. They always have to be the topic of what's being discussed. And if they're not the topic, they will do something to get attention back onto themselves, right? Satan struggled with an eye problem. He developed the eye problem. And it's interesting. What is the middle letter in sin? What is the middle letter in pride? I. When we have an eye problem, it means we're prideful. And if we're prideful, we have a what kind of problem? A sin problem. Satan had an eye problem. And the reason why that's a problem is because Ezekiel explains to us in chapter 28. Turn me to Ezekiel. You're in Isaiah right now. The very next book is Jeremiah. And then there's a small book called Lamentations. And right after that is the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28, 12 through 19. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. We are going to pick up the story here in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19, and see why it's such a problem that Satan has an eye problem. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. Thou sillest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. 
Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that you were created. Verse 14, you are the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so... You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, I want to pause right now because in verse 12, it says, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus. How do we know that this is not talking about an earthly king? How do we know that this is a symbolic message talking about somebody else? Let me ask you a question. Who was in the Garden of Eden? There was only four beings in the Garden of Eden. Jesus, because he's creator. Adam, because he was created. Eve, because she was created. And there was one more being in the Garden of Eden. Do you know who it was? It was Satan, and he was the tempter. And then it goes on, and it says that not only were you in the Garden of Eden, but in verse 14, you are the anointed cherub. Now, let me ask you another question. Of those four beings that were in the garden in the Garden of Eden, who was the cherub? That is a heavenly, I mean, sorry, that is an angelic being. Is Jesus an angelic being? No, he is God. Is Adam an angelic being? No, he's human. Is Eve an angelic being? No, she's human. So who can only this be talking about? Satan. Yes. Lucifer when he was created, but at this point he became Satan. This is talking about none other than Satan. Now God is going to give us insight to his eye problem. Verse 15, you were perfect in your eyes from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. God says, Satan, you were perfect. There was no sin in you. You were a beautiful angel. In fact, you were the most beautiful angel of all the angels until iniquity was found in you. Did God create some righteous angels and some unholy, unrighteous angels? No. Did God create a devil? No. No, The Bible's clear. It says that you were perfect. God created a perfect angelic being. Let me ask you another question. Did Hitler's mom create Adolf Hitler? Did she hold him as a little boy, as, as a little precious boy, the boy, the, the, the apple of her eye? Did she hold him in her arms and look at him and spit in his face and slap him and say, you are going to hate Jews. You're going to be a maniacal psychotic. Did he sit there and she, she sit there and do that to baby Adolf Hitler every single day? No, in fact, Hitler's father was an abusive man, and she often stood in between the father and Adolf Hitler to protect him. She was a good mother, but somehow, even though he was her perfect little baby boy in her arms, he became the monster we know as Adolf Hitler. God is trying to tell us that he didn't create the devil. He didn't create the enemy. He didn't create the adversary. He created Lucifer, a beautiful, light-bearing, perfect, heavenly angel. But something happened, and he changed and became the devil, the enemy, the adversary. What was it? Look at verse 16. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Why was it lifted up? Why did he become pride? Because of his beauty. The Bible is clear. God made Satan perfect. He was a beautiful, angelic being. And because of his beauty, he became prideful. He developed an eye problem. Let's continue on. 
I want to give you a few more lessons from this, from this passage. Your heart has lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And now God says, I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. In verse 16, we know that Satan was made perfect. He was the light bearer. His job was to go around and deliver truth to everybody. All the other angels expected to hear truth, messages of truth from Satan. That's what they expected to hear from Satan. That's what they expected to hear him do. But because of his beauty, his heart got corrupt. And in verse 16, it tells us that instead of delivering truth, instead of delivering light from God, it says, by the multitude of thy merchandise. Now, it's interesting, the word for merchandise, the word, the word trade, comes from the Hebrew verb rakal, and it means to go about from one person to another. He went from person to person, from angel to angel. He started trading, but what was he trading? Remember, there was war in heaven, and what was that war? It was polemy. Lucifer became a polemic. He started sharing his version. He started sharing his truth. And as he shared his version and his truth, he started telling lies about the character of God. In other words, Satan's trade, Satan's merchandise, Satan's business was to go around and spread lies about God and specifically lies about God's character. And what does God say he's going to do? It says that he's going to lay him down to the ground. In the Hebrew, that equals the earth. He's going to place him before kings. Now, in Revelation 5.10, we can be a king or sometimes an advisor. Behold thee, in verse 17, is judgment language. In other words, God says, because you are going around casting lies about my character, because your heart has been puffed up, because you have become prideful because of your beauty, and you've went around, and you've been telling everybody how bad of a God I am. You've been telling everybody how many, all these lies about me. I'm going to cast you to the earth, and I'm going to lay you before judges. I'm going to let the judge, I'm going to let the people of earth judge whether you are righteous or unrighteous, whether you're telling the truth or whether you're lying. That was God's plan for Lucifer. And brothers and sisters, I want to share the good news with you in advance now. When judgment is complete, then Satan is destroyed. When judgment is complete, then we are set free. When judgment is complete, the great adversary is gone, and we live without sin and suffering for the rest of our lives. The Bible is clear that Satan is going to be cast before us, and we are going to learn to decipher between his lies and God's truth. And when Jesus brings judgment, judgment on Satan, he's going to deliver us, his righteous people, those who have a connection with Jesus and those who want to have a connection with Jesus. He's going to deliver us from those lies and he's going to take us to a place where there's no more pain or suffering and there's no more sin the rest of eternity. The next question is, why didn't God destroy Lucifer during his rebellion? Imagine, imagine that a CNN story comes out tomorrow, and it's all well to see. In this case, it'd be Fox News. Imagine on Fox News tomorrow, a story comes across, and the headline in the ticker is, Joseph Biden, an embezzler. And then you look at the rest of the details in the story, and it says that Biden steals 0.0001% of every dollar every American makes. What would America think? And how would he ever be able to clear his name if it was not true? How would he be able to clear his name if it wasn't true? If the news came out and said that he was a thief and he was stealing money from every dollar every American makes, how would he be able to clear his name if that wasn't true? In Ezekiel 28, 16 through 19, God makes us a king or a judge. 
And now he follows his own advice and he displays his case before the universe. If Biden just had the reporters killed, that would only make you think that he was guilty. How would he ever clear his name? He would have to display his case before the entire country. He would have to open up all of the documents to everybody, and everybody would have to have full transparency to know if he could be trusted or if he was a thief. God has been put in a place where somebody has lied about his character. There's been a Fox News, a CNN News, a taker that went across the screen, and we all seen it, and it said, God is not fair. He's got a smite button on his computer, and he's waiting for you to do something wrong so he can cast judgment on you and punish you. That is the ticker that went across. Those are the lies that the devil foretold. And how would God ever clear his name? There's only one way, brothers and sisters. He must let the case be played out in front of the entire universe in complete transparency so every man, woman, and child can make their own mind up whether God is a tyrant or not. God had to let it play out so the angels could trust him. God had to let it play out so the universe could trust him. God has to let it play out so that you can trust him. But another logical question is, why did God create Lucifer? Why didn't God just program Lucifer so he could never make a choice? So we would never have the problems that we have on earth today. Because love can never be forced. Love must always be chosen. If you take away the power of choice, you take away the ability to love. If you take away the ability to choose, you take away the ability to love. If you take away the ability to love, you take away the opportunity to be happy. You guys know how I propose to my wife, don't you? I've been married now for 14 years. I went for a drive with my wife one night. I'm sorry, she wasn't my wife then. She became my wife after that night. I went for her drive. Her name is Sharna. Went for a drive with Sharna one night. We were in the car. We were having a good time. I took her to this beautiful, secluded place, the scenic overlook where she could look over everything and see everything. And I got on one knee, and I reached underneath the seat, and I pulled out a forty-five and I put it to her head. And I said, marry me. I know it's romantic. What do you think she would say if I did that? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. She would say yes, but not because she loved me, but because she was afraid for her life. Love must be a choice. It cannot be forced. God can't force us to love him. He has to let us choose. He made Lucifer a beautiful perfect being and he put him in a perfect environment and he showered with him with love but that being decided to choose not to love god he decided to choose that he wanted all the affection and all the attention that god was getting in verse 16 of ezekiel 28 it says that lucifer sinned but what is sin You know, my friend told me this story. He went around in his neighborhood, and he was asking everybody, what is sin? How would you define sin? What would you tell anybody what a sin is? He said he went to this one neighbor, and he said, what is sin? And his neighbor looked at him, and he said, it's something bad. It's what my neighbor does. <laughs> now, maybe, maybe we have neighbors like that, and we think that that's what sin is. But the Bible gives us a definition as if Webster wrote it himself. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The law establishes somebody's authority. We know that the state police have authority on the highways when we drive by a speed limit sign, right? And if we don't follow that speed limit sign, we might get a ticket. The law establishes authority. So why would Satan attack God's law? Because he doesn't want to be under God's authority. 
If Satan keeps God's law, then he's showing the universe that he's under God's authority. But Satan said, I'm going to be my own God. I'm not going to be under anybody's authority. And therefore, he has to break the law of God. And according to the, the verse, breaking the law of God is the definition of sin. Sin is the breaking of the law. So, or as Paul writes, do you not know that whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? It's simple. What is sin? It's the breaking of the law. Why would Satan break the law? Because it shows authority. The law shows authority. And Paul says, listen, if you're keeping God's law, you're under obedience to him. But if you're not keeping his law, you're under obedience to Satan. Satan wanted to be under his own authority. So Satan led a rebellion in heaven. And this rebellion was continued on earth. How? Come with me to the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. How was this rebellion continued on earth? Go to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 6. God gave one simple command in Eden, one simple command to Adam and Eve. He says, listen, you can do everything you want, but there's this one thing you can't do. You can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of all these other myriads and millions of plants and fruits and vegetables and everything and nuts and beans and legumes and grains that I put out here, but you can't eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. That's the only thing you can't do. And what did our parents do? You guessed it. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Rebellion came to earth because our first parents, Adam and Eve, decided to break God's law. They decided to do that one thing that God said you can't do. And in doing so, they removed themselves from the authority of God and they placed themselves under the authority of the devil. But because they chose to follow Satan's lies and not God's truth, the Bible teaches us that the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. In other words, when they put themselves underneath the authority of Satan, sin came into this world, and now Satan is the prince of this world. Because God gave man dominion of the earth and man chose to follow Satan, that's why bad things happen to good people. That's why we suffer in this earth. That's why all creation groans and longs for something better. Because we chose to follow Satan. And here's the problem. Our sin doesn't affect just ourselves. It affects everybody around us. Like throwing a stone into a pond and the ripples go out larger and larger and larger until they get to the other side of the shore, our sin does the same thing. When I was younger, when I was 20 years old, I decided to go drinking one night. My girlfriend at the time, we went drinking, we got drunk, and we decided it was time to go home. So we got in the car and we started driving home. We got into a fight, as young couples do, and as we got into this fight, I remember getting very angry at her. And how did, I re how did I show her that I was angry? I started driving my car faster and faster and faster. I started driving my car as fast as it would go. But because of my drunken stupor, because I didn't recognize where I was at, I was on a different road than the road that I thought that I was on. And I came around this corner, and as soon as I came around this corner, I saw a stop sign. 
I slammed on my brakes as hard as I could, and after 227 foot of skid marks in the road, I hit a parked van that the road dead ended into. As I hit this van, my girlfriend at the time was shoved underneath a dashboard on the passenger floorboard, and she separated both of her hips and her shoulder. The only thing I could think of was trying to get out of trouble, so I asked her if she could run. When I found out she couldn't, I knew it was time to call the cops. When the cops got there, I decided that I was going to continue my drunken stupor, and I was going to fight with them, and I refused to take a breath laser, so they had to take me to the hospital to draw my blood. And as we were pulling into the parking lot to get my blood drawn, I looked out the back window, and I seen something I will never forget as long as I live. At 2.30 in the morning, my girlfriend's mother got a phone call from the police that her daughter was in a car accident and being rushed to the hospital, and she needs to get there as soon as she could. And I saw that mother step out of her car and run frantically over to the cop car to see where her daughter was, and I could see the look of horror on her face. The reason why I'm telling you this story right now is because that woman, that mother did nothing wrong. She was sleeping in her bed at two in the morning when a phone call woke her up because of my sin. Our sin is not committed on an island. It affects everybody around us. Oops. What was God keeping from Adam and Eve? Sin and its result. What is the result of sin? The wages of death. What was God trying to keep from them? Shame, guilt, pain, worry, fear, anxiety. God never wanted us to experience these emotions. He planned for us to live in happiness. But the Bible says your iniquities, your sins, have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Adam and Eve hid when God came. After they sinned, they heard the voice of God calling for them, and they ran, they hid behind trees. But God was coming to protect them. God was coming to redeem them. God was coming to try to save them, but their sins had separated them from their God. Adam's new perspective of God and his character, he, was trying, he thought that God was trying to keep something from him, but he found out that God was trying to protect him. And praise the Lord, there was a plan to save man. When Satan works, God counters. He, Jesus himself likewise, shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. God would become man and counter Satan's plan. Satan rejoiced at the death of Jesus, but the death of Jesus actually sealed Satan's fate. And so we ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because Satan wants worship. And the story of Matthew, you can find this story in Matthew chapter 4, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to summarize for you, but read this later, especially if you're at home. Matthew chapter 4, Satan comes to Jesus, and he tempts him three times. The first time he comes to him, he says, turn these, turn these stones into bread. Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was famished. He was hunger. He needed food. And Satan came to him at his lowest moment, and he said, turn these stones into bread if you're the Son of God. But say Jesus refused. The second time he took him up onto a temple and he said, cast yourself off. The angels will take care of you with your son of God. But Jesus refused. And then the third time, Satan showed his true colors. He took him up to the highest point in the earth and he said, worship me and I'll give you all of these kingdoms. What does Satan want? He wants worship. Now here's the spot. Here's something I want you to notice. If Jesus had turned the stones into bread, he would have been worshiping Satan. If Jesus would have thrown himself off the temple, he would have been worshiping Satan. 
Brothers and sisters, we think that we can outsmart the devil. We think it doesn't matter if it's a, we think things are trivial that God says don't do. We think it doesn't matter, but I want to remind you right now, it was only a bite of a fruit that got us into the situation that we find ourselves in right now. It doesn't matter how trivial you think it is. If God put it in his word, if God wrote it down so that you could read it later in time, it matters to God. It doesn't matter how small you think it is. Is, God is trying to protect you from some greater harm, and that's why he put it in there. Please, just do what God is asking you to do. Revelation 13, 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. This Antichrist power. He uses Satan as his front... I'm sorry, Satan uses this front man, Antichrist... Through the Antichrist power confuses perception of God's people as to what truth is. The truth of God is taught in the Word of God. His character is revealed to us in here. His character is revealed to us by the life of Jesus Christ. God's character is revealed to us through this. It's not revealed to us through philosophy or man-made works. He, Satan wants to work through the Antichrist power to lead man from the plain teachings of Scripture. But let's answer this question one more time. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is the world the way it is? The Bible says in 1 Peter 5.8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil is walking around this earth just looking anywhere he can to find somebody that will follow him to find somebody that can fall into sin because he knows that if you fall into sin, it's going to affect somebody else and that's going to affect somebody else and that's going to affect somebody else until something really bad happens to somebody and Satan and his angels sit back and they laugh at your pain. They laugh at your suffering. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much suffering? Why are there famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and death? Because an angel who was created with the ability to choose wanted to be worshipped. The reason why there's so much suffering in this world is because Satan didn't want to worship God. He wanted to take all that worship on to himself. And ever since then, He's been blaming God for every problem this universe has ever seen. This dad walks by his boy's room every single night. And every single night he hears the same thing. (laughs) Every night, this dad walks by this little boy's room and he hears the same thing. <laughs> if you only knew what I knew. <laughs> if you only knew what I knew. Every night he walks by, he hears, <laughs> if you only knew what I knew. If you only knew what I knew. One day the father can't handle it no more. He's walking by his son's room and he hears, <laughs> if you only knew what I knew. And he opens the door and he says, Son, How come every night I walk by your door, I hear the same thing? I hear you laughing, and you repeat the phrase, if you only knew what I knew. And the boy says, oh, Dad, oh, Dad, I've been reading this book that you gave me, and it's about this sheriff and this bad, bad, evil man. And the book started out one day, this evil man, this bad, evil man, he came into town, and he was causing trouble, and the sheriff went to confront him, and that bad, evil man whooped that sheriff, and he drove him right out of town. And he said, I got so angry, I put the book down. Didn't want to read about a book about a good sheriff being taken out by a bad, evil man. He said, but then I had an idea. I decided to pick that book back up and read the last chapter. And Dad, if you would have read that last chapter, you would know that that bad, evil man comes into town. But this time, the sheriff's been working out. This time, the sheriff got tougher, and he took that bad, evil man by the nap of his neck, and he drug him right through town, and he took care of him for good. And so now, when I read that book, chapter for chapter, I sit there and I say to myself, ha ha, if you only knew what I knew. Someday, brothers and sisters, The good sheriff is going to come to town 
And he's going to take that bad, evil devil and he's going to grab him by the nap of his neck and he's going to drive him out of town. He's going to take care of him for good. Don't get disheartened. Don't get disparaged because soon Jesus, the good sheriff, is going to take care of that adversary, the devil, the enemy. And if you only knew what I knew, you would know that the devil's already a defeated foe. His days are numbered, and soon there's not going to be any more sin. Soon there's not going to be any more pain. Soon there's not going to be any more suffering because the good sheriff Jesus is going to destroy the enemy once and for all. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. One day, Jesus, the sheriff of the universe, is going to go throw J the, the devil into jail. There will be a day when you will never have to go to the hospital again. There will be a day where you never have to attend another funeral. There will be a day where you never get sick again. The day will be when God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Friends, don't you want to live in a place with no pain or death? To live in a place where the lamb, beautiful little lamb, snuggles up with a great big lion? Well, you'll never grow old. Well, you'll never have to say goodbye again. Well, you'll never have to stand by the deathbed of a loved one. My father and I, we didn't get along. When I was a little kid, he abandoned me. I've seen him a handful of times from the ages of 8 to 18. I can count on one hand the amount of times I've seen him. Wasn't around. Didn't do anything with me. I became a Christian. I started praying that I wanted Jesus to restore that relationship. I lived with my dad. Lived in the same house with him. Never spoke to him for a year. Couldn't stand him. But when I became a Christian... I wanted that to change. I used to go for walks with my dad when he would take his dog for a walk, and I would try to talk to him, but we could never move our relationship past a very superficial relationship. The only thing we could talk about was work and football. That was it. Never opened up, never became a dad to me. I kept on praying that we would restore that relationship. Then I got the call one day. My dad had died, and I remember being angry. I remember being mad. I was mad at God because I had prayed that God would restore that relationship. And I had made myself available for God to restore that relationship. And I had tried hard for God to restore that relationship. But that relationship never got restored. And I was angry and mad at God. And I said, God, it's all your fault. Why didn't you take care of this relationship? And in my anger... I heard this still, small voice. Now, I'm not talking about a real voice, but I got this impression in my mind. God said, if you only knew what I know. If you only knew what I know. Someday, I expect God to make that relationship right. It might not be here, but maybe when we get to heaven and there's no more confusion. There's no more suffering. There's no more bickering and fighting. There's no more sin. Finally, that relationship will be restored. Don't you want to be where Jesus is? In this battle between good and evil, I can't trust my own power. I can't trust my own strength. I can only trust the Bible and God. Do you guys want to trust the Bible? Do you want to quit relying on your own strength and say, Jesus, I'm going to trust your word. I'm going to surrender to you. If you're at home, and you're following along at home, I just want you to take a minute. If you're on YouTube or if you're on Facebook or any other social media site you like to post on, just pull out your phone or type on your computer right there. I choose to trust God. I choose.
to trust the Bible. If you could just post that, we'd appreciate it. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you will help us to not rely on our own power, Lord, to quit thinking that we're smarter than the devil and just trust your word and just trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. And just a reminder, tomorrow there is no meeting. We're taking Monday night off. We're giving you a chance to do some laundry and get caught up on chores, the things you have to do. But we will meet up again on Tuesday at 7 p.m. And we're going to talk about, was Jesus who he said he was? Was, excuse me, was Jesus really the son of God or just an imposter making a radical claim? And we're going to look at a forbidden prophecy to prove that. So you'll want to tune in Tuesday night at 7 p.m. if you're out there and if you want to join us back again here in person, Tuesday night at 7. Thank you. Have a great night.